So according to the World Health Organization, roughly 72% of the global population is deficient in iodine with roughly 30% of the American population deficient as well. And so in this video, I wanna take a super deep dive into iodine, what iodine is, why it's so critical for proper endocrine function as well as cognitive function, as well as how to get enough iodine in your diet. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Now, the successful use of seaweed to treat conditions to such as goiters actually dates back nearly 6,000 years. However, it wasn't until 1811 when iodine was first identified as an element that its presence was discovered in seaweed. And in 1852, the first ever paper was published by a French nutritionist proposing iodine deficiency to be the cause of conditions such as goiter. But it wasn't until nearly 70 years later in the early 1920s that widespread salt iodization began in the U.S. and Switzerland. And at the time, some regions in the U.S. had a prevalence of clinical goiters of up to 70% of the population. Iodine deficiency was a full-blown public health issue, and it's estimated that roughly 30% of all registrants um, to World War I were actually turned away because of clinical signs of goiter in some regions. However, by 1948, roughly 75% of U.S. households were exclusively using iodinized salt, and by that time, the prevalence of goiter actually dropped to around 15% of the U.S. population. By 1971, the average um, urinary iodine content in America was roughly 320 micrograms per liter. However, by the early 2000s, this number had dropped to roughly 160 micrograms per liter, a 50% drop suggesting that an iodine deficiency may still be an issue in Western countries. Now, iodine status is usually determined by measuring the uh, urinary content of iodine and anything between 100 to 200 micrograms per liter is typically considered sufficient and even though the average UIC in America is roughly 160 micrograms per liter roughly 28 percent of the population actually falls below the recommended levels which means roughly 28 percent of Americans are actually considered deficient in iodine. Now it's often stated that because of why spread salt iodization here in America, uh, that an iodine deficiency is no longer an issue. However, this is simply not true. Iodine levels have dropped by nearly 50% over the past 50 years here in America. And when you look at other Western countries, such as New Zealand, that have tested uh, their school-aged children for iodine deficiency and have found um, roughly an 80% rate of deficiency in their country. And so even though iodine deficiency is typically an issue in developing countries, it is somewhat clear that there are still some Western countries that are still dealing with iodine deficiency as a public health issue. And so the obvious question to ask here is why is this still an issue if there is widespread salt iodization that is currently happening? Why are we still seeing such high rates of iodine deficiency? However, before we dive into this uh, question, I do want to give a huge shout out to today's video sponsor. Now, as we'll talk about here shortly, one of the biggest impacts of iodine deficiency on the body is actually in hormone production, which is why testing your hormone levels can be such a great way to vicariously test for overall health and nutritional status. Now, whether you need to check your testosterone levels or your estrogen levels or prolactin levels or thyroid hormone levels, Let's Get Checked offers a variety of hormone panels that every guy should be checking on a somewhat frequent basis. And so if this is something that you've never done, I would highly recommend looking into something like this. Having data in your hand can dramatically influence what type of health strategy you implement. Now, the really cool thing about Let's Get Checked is that they have hands down the most convenient test on the market considering that you can actually take your test from at home. Once you order your test, they actually send it to your doorstep where you can perform the test at home, you mail it back to them, and within a few days, you actually get your results through their online portal. And on top of that, you also get a consultation with a healthcare practitioner that will actually walk you through your results. So if you are interested in something like this, make sure to check out the description down below for 25% off of your test. So the question still remains, why are Americans still deficient in 
in iodine, if widespread salt iodization is currently happening. And um, I don't think this is actually quite clear yet. However, there are a handful of leading theories that I want to talk about. And the first possible culprit is just simply intentional sodium restriction. At this point, we have gone through several decades of recommendations to limit salt intake in order to um, improve cardiovascular health and reduce blood pressure. And because of this, one of the unintended side effects of this is that we are unintentionally lowering our iodine intake as well. Now, another possible culprit is that we are not consuming foods that are typically high in iodine. Now, these would be foods um, that typically originate from the ocean, things like fish and salmon and seaweed and even things like cranberries that are grown in ocean water. And so because the typical American does not consume a lot of ocean products, a lot of Americans just simply aren't getting a lot of iodine in uh, their diet through food products. Now, the next possible culprit is that only 50% of the U.S. population is actually consuming iodinized salt. And this could possibly be because of a handful of reasons, but one of the primary reasons is that a large portion of the population has actually shifted towards consuming sea salt, which is not iodinized. Now, another possible culprit is that bread manufacturers are no longer using iodine as an oxidizing agent uh, during bread manufacturing and are instead using things such as bromate, which actually compete with iodine um, in the body for absorption, which could be further exacerbating um, an iodine deficiency in America. Now, again, it's not exactly clear how big of a role these factors are playing in um, possible iodine deficiencies. However, it is likely that all of these are contributing to some degree. However, now that we've established why a possible iodine deficiency can be such an issue here in Western countries, I do want to spend a lot of this video actually diving into the role of iodine in the body so that we can kind of get a grasp of what's actually going on in the instance of iodine deficiency. Now, the two biggest roles that iodine plays in the body are one in endocrine function and the production of various hormones and two in proper cognitive development and cognition. Now, when it comes to iodine's effects on hormones, the most pronounced and obvious effect that uh, iodine has on hormone function is thyroid hormone production. Now, the thyroid gland obviously produces thyroid hormones, but it actually uses iodine as a direct substrate for thyroid hormone production. And when there's not enough iodine in the diet and the body doesn't have enough iodine to produce thyroid hormones, obviously thyroid hormones drop. Now, when iodine levels fall too low, there is a condition known as a goiter, uh, which can develop, which, which is simply a swollen thyroid gland, but is also accompanied by a drop in thyroid hormones, which can cause things like a drop in energy production, a drop in growth rates, as well as a drop in cognitive function. However, one of the roles that thyroid hormones don't get a lot of attention in is actually their role in promoting muscular growth. Thyroid hormones do have a catabolic effect in um, their regards to energy production. However, they also have an anabolic effect on muscle growth. Thyroid hormones have a direct role in regulating some of the genes that are responsible for um, muscular growth and muscle fibers being able to differentiate and grow. And when thyroid hormones are low, obviously these genes are suppressed and proper uh, muscle function and muscle growth cannot actually occur. However, aside from iodine's direct effects on thyroid hormones, it also has an effect indirectly on testosterone production. Low thyroid hormones are actually associated, strongly associated with um, hypogonadism in men. And when thyroid hormones are low, your hypothalamus actually releases a hormone known as thyrotropin releasing hormone, which stimulates the pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone, which then stimulates the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormones. However, when the hypothalamus releases TRH to produce TSH from the pituitary, TRH actually also um, causes the, the production of prolactin as well. Now, the reason this is an issue is that prolactin also has a suppressive effect on the HPG axis. And so when thyroid levels drop, there's a rise in prolactin and a suppression of the HPG axis and therefore um, of testosterone production as well. But not only are thyroid hormone levels responsible for helping to regulate the production of prolactin, 
prolactin. They also appear to regulate the sensitivity of neurons in the pituitary and the testes to respond to gonadotropic releasing hormone and luteinizing hormone. And so when thyroid hormones drop, the HPG axis actually gets less sensitive to these hormones and therefore also produces less testosterone because of this. And if this wasn't enough, low thyroid hormone levels are also associated with an increase in sex hormone binding globulin, which is a protein that binds to testosterone, rendering it inactive. And so not only do thyroid hormone levels help to regulate the production of testosterone, but they also seem to regulate free testosterone as well. Now, even though iodine has a massive impact on endocrine function, it can be argued that the biggest impact that iodine has is actually on cognitive function. It's been estimated that iodinizing salt in a given population can actually reduce the incidence of low intelligence by up to 75% in some cases and actually increase the average IQ by up to 10 points, which is actually almost an entire standard deviation above the norm in certain populations. Now, iodine appears to do this vicariously by one of two ways. One is through improving thyroid hormone functions. Um, thyroid hormone receptors are expressed universally throughout the body, including the brain. And so um, when you have proper thyroid hormone production, it will promote uh, brain cell differentiation as well as energy uh, utilization and production in the brain. However, it also appears that iodine has a direct role in gene expression in brain cells. Iodine appears to influence neurogenesis, neuron and glial cells cell differentiation, myelination of neurons, neuron migration, and synaptogenesis, which is why according to the World Health Organization, iodine deficiency is the number one preventable cause of mental impairment globally. And so the long story short here is that when iodine intake is insufficient, uh, cognitive function and endocrine function are dramatically impaired. And by correcting that insufficiency, um, there can be a dramatic improvement in those markers as well. Now, when it comes to consuming a proper amount of iodine per day, the RDA for iodine has been set at 150 micrograms per day. However, there are some studies that do show benefit from consuming up to 1.2 milligrams per day with little to no side effects. And in some countries such as Japan, for instance, they have been shown to consume up to three milligrams per day without any serious side effects as well. However, when it comes to uh, daily proper supplementation, 150 to 300 micrograms per, uh, per day will uh, be sufficient for most individuals. Now, when it comes to foods that are high in iodine, by far your best dietary source of iodine is actually going to be seaweed, which is why Japanese individuals individuals tend to have an extremely high um, intake of iodine. Now, ocean fish also have an extremely high content of iodine, things like salmon and cod, as well as oysters and shrimp. Now, cranberries also have an extremely high um, content of iodine, as well as potatoes and things such as milk and eggs. And so you can typically get your recommended intake of iodine by consuming things like fish and other ocean animals animals as well as potatoes and cranberries and milk and eggs. However, if you want to supplement with iodine, um, supplementing with sea kelp or seaweed or sea moss can also be a good way to supplement your iodine intake or you can opt for things like potassium iodide, which is a super cheap form of iodine uh, that you can get from most kind of your um, health stores and supplement stores that can also provide um, a respectable amount of iodine as well. Now, if you're interested in seeing how much iodine these foods contain, I would highly recommend going to a website called My Food Data, which is an awesome website that kind of gives all the foods that are highest in specific micronutrients, things like my vitamins and minerals. But other than that, make sure to check out the description down below for 25% off of an at-home hormone test, as well as a link to the complete guide to supplementation, which is a guide that walks you through all the top proven um, supplements for the top health goals for men. And so if you are um, interested in only taking supplements that actually work, that will become an invaluable resource to you. Uh, but other than that, guys, make sure to leave a comment down below if you have any questions, and I will see you guys later.